I've just received a report from that team. I'm afraid it's much worse than was feared. On this episode of Old Joe's Reminiscence, when Gene Roddenberry takes his second wife on a vacation to the Bahamas, he certainly does a lot of banging away on his typewriter. After Star Trek was canceled in 1969, its creator and producer Gene Roddenberry felt safe to divorce his first wife. Within days, he married his former mistress, actress Majel Barrett, whom he'd met in 1961. In 1963, Gene hired Majel for a role on an episode of his show, The Lieutenant. He then cast her as Captain Pike's second-in-command on Star Trek. Network executives wouldn't let him keep her in that position, so he put a wig on her and cast her as Nurse Chapel. I was never really a fan of May Jell, and personally, I thought her acting was a bit stiff. I doubt that she would have been anything close to successful if she hadn't been cast by Roddenberry. In my opinion, with her choppy delivery style, her best possible role was as the USS Enterprise computer voice. Easy, lad. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. That's right. In 1972, the couple took a summer vacation in the Bahamas. Gene got out his typewriter and he started writing a new screenplay. Because that's what everyone does while vacationing in the Bahamas. Am I right? He wrote the script for a proposed new science fiction pilot, Genesis 2. The CBS television network ordered Gene's pilot and it aired in March of 1973. I remember reading an article in the TV Guide promoting Genesis 2. The pilot aired 51 years ago on the CBS Friday Night Movie. The ratings seemed good enough to practically guarantee that a series was going to be greenlit. Roddenberry prepped 20 story ideas, but CBS had also acquired the rights to air the first three Planet of the Apes films. It was a game changer. With quite a bit of fanfare, including behind the scenes specials, CBS ran the very first Apes film in September of 1973, and its ratings far surpassed those of Genesis 2. Quite understandable, considering how very pioneering those apes films were at the time. And how CBS went all out in promoting the film's television premiere. A Planet of the Apes series was soon proposed. Now, since both sci-fi films had a very similar plot line, present-day man going to a post-apocalyptic future, CBS had a decision to make and they opted to order the more popular Planet of the Apes series for their fall lineup. That doesn't mean that Genesis 2 was bad. It was simply at the wrong network at the wrong time. Now, I've re-watched Genesis 2 many, many times since 1974, but it's been a while. I'm going to warn you, if you haven't seen Genesis 2, 
you should watch it first, or you may discover the final level of pain. Now, let's jump forward in time to Genesis 2. The film opens with a voiceover. My name is Dylan Hunt. Star Alex Cord was the first in a long line of Gene Roddenberry's characters to be named Dylan Hunt. Alex Cord was born Alexander V. Espy Jr. in New York on May 3, 1933. He contracted polio at the age of 12 and spent some time in an iron lung. Recovering on a Wyoming ranch, he dreamed of being a horseman. He dropped out of high school in pursuit of that dream, only to be thrown from a bull during a rodeo in Madison Square Garden. He attended night school to gain acceptance and receive a degree in literature from New York University. He appeared in Summer Stock and was nominated for the Best Actor Award by the London Critics Circle. His prior experience with horses got him into Hollywood westerns. Out of his scores of appearances, he is probably best known for his portrayal of Archangel in 55 episodes of the mid-80s action series Airwolf. He retired from acting after appearing in the 2009 film Fire from Below. Alex Cord died on August 9, 2021 at the age of 88. He's being prepared for a NASA experiment, attempting suspended animation to further deep space exploration. All right, that's your last chance, Dylan. I can still have a girl waiting here to revive you. I don't think NASA's ready for that method yet. I wish they were. Good luck. The joke about having a girl there to revive him went over my head at first. Test animals had required sexual stimulation immediately afterward to survive the experiment, but NASA had developed an IV solution as a substitute. Everything seems to be going fine until an earthquake drops most of a mountain on top of Dylan's chamber. Using act breaks from the final draft script, which may vary from the network's film presentation. In Act 1, a team is exploring the caves. A lantern beam crosses Dylan's lifeless body. Several people come to help move debris away, and through a comedy of errors, the team gains access to the chamber. The head of the team is Primus Kimbridge, played by Canadian actor Percy Rodriguez. We've seen him before in Star Trek and The Star Lost. Percy Rodriguez, of African and Portuguese heritage, was born in Montreal on June 13, 1918. He became a professional boxer while keeping an eye open for acting jobs. He joined Montreal's Negro Theatre Guild and won a Canadian Drama Festival Acting Award in 1939. Acting job offers were scarce, so he went to work as a machinist and toolmaker. His distinctive voice got him jobs narrating several Canadian documentaries and he appeared on television, but he was focused on the stage. He made his Broadway debut in Toys in the Attic. Film and television offers followed and he moved to Los Angeles. Percy was hired to play Commodore Stone in an episode of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. He was cast as a neurosurgeon in the popular soap Peyton Place. He had many small roles and he lent his voice to nearly a hundred film trailers. He retired from acting around 1990. Percy Rodriguez died on September 6, 2007. Another Star Trek favorite is here. She's Lyra Ah, played by Mariette Hartley. Mariette Hartley was born Mary Loretta Hartley on June 21, 1940 in Connecticut. She studied theater and got her first role in the 1962 film Ride the High Country. 
she made scores of television appearances, including one very memorable appearance in an episode of Star Trek. But she is probably best remembered for her series of more than 250 Polaroid commercials. Her chemistry with James Garner in those camera ads led many to believe the two were married. She was awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for television on June 11, 1987. Mariette Hartley continues to work in the theater. Primus Kimbridge notices that the man on the table is slowly breathing. Much as had happened with Khan in Star Trek, Dylan finds it difficult to speak, but he wants to know how long. It is the year 2133. They wheel him down the redressed corridors, past incredible collections of artwork, and we hear children singing. He asks for his stimulant. They have nothing like it there. Will he survive? In the next scene, it's eight days later. Lyra Ah is tending to Dylan, who's been cleaned up and shaved, all but his Alex Cord's iconic mustache. His memory is a bit fuzzy. Do you remember how I've cared for you? Answering his question about where he is, Lyra Ah tells him about Pax. They call themselves Pax, Peace, to fool others. She's Tyrannian, a mutant. Her two hearts give her extra strength. She drops her robe to reveal her two belly buttons. I'm a mutant. Now, this is something Gene Roddenberry wrote in to thumb his nose at network censors, who wouldn't let actresses show their navels on Star Trek or other shows in the 1960s. So he showed them. He gave Lyra Ah two. <laughs> In Act 2, we meet security primus Yulof, played by character actor Titos Vandis. We'd also seen him in an episode of Search. He's addressing the multiracial Pax Council. He says that Dylan has been there for 15 days, and so far, all he knows of Pax has been told to him by the half-human Lyra Ah. Majel plays Primus Dominic, who has one line here and another later in the show, as does Beulah Kuo as Primus Lu Chan. Two others appear with non-speaking roles. Harper Smythe interrupts the meeting to inform them that The man from the past is out of his quarters. He's with Lyra Ah. Harper Smythe is played by Lynn Marta, Previously, she'd been a semi-regular on Love American Style. She later played dozens of supporting roles, and sadly she died in January of this year. We cut to Lyra Ah showing Dylan around. Good Lord, and go, or Chevy, and Brad. It's incredible. He sure knows his artists. Lyra Ah tells him that Pax has looted the world. No one is safe from them. He mentions hearing children singing, but she claims that he must have been dreaming. No one sings here without being ordered to. The rapid elevator they use is powered by an old nuclear plant that is still operating. They go outside where the landscape is beautiful. Then the music turns ominous as he notices camouflaged sentinels. Look. Every way in or out of here is watched constantly. Dylan realizes that everything and everyone he knew is gone. Lyra Ah starts giving Dylan a history lesson, 
before she's interrupted by Kimbridge and Ulof. Well, I was hoping to welcome you to our century in a different fashion, Dylan Hunt. I am Primus Kimbridge, who found you, and this is Primus Ulof. Dylan cops an attitude almost immediately. Lyra Ah has told him that he'd be meeting with security. They dismiss Lyra Ah and they ask Dylan what she's been telling him. He's not very cooperative, being cautious, considering everything he's been told by Lyra Ah. When Dylan returns to his quarters, Harper Smythe is busy tidying up. In the middle of the night, Dylan wakes to find her being bound and gagged by Lyra Ah. Where are we going? To the freest, most beautiful place on earth, if you wish it. My city, Terrania. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh. Act 3 opens in the sub-shuttle station. What are you doing? It only fires the dart which causes unconsciousness. She shoots the guard who falls to the floor. That's fast acting stuff. A guard spies Dylan running to the platform and he tranquilizes Dylan. Lyra Ah knocks that second guard out with a karate chop. In the next scene, Dylan comes to in that sub-shuttle. Lyra Ah is in the driver's seat. They exit at a maintenance station, and Lyra Ah sends the shuttle on its way. I think I'd turn around and head back upon seeing this encampment. The next morning, Dylan and Lyra Ah ride horses across a rich pasture land. It's full of wildlife straight out of the 1960s wilderness documentaries. It's almost enough to make me long for a nuclear annihilation. Lyra Ah shows Dylan the location of their nuclear generator plant. It's beginning to fail. Perhaps the distance to our city makes it weaker. Do you understand such things? It's a long ride on horseback, but they eventually reach Tyrannia, with a trumpet fanfare. Seeing the costumes being worn by the Tyrannians, I started to get Star Trek Plato's stepchildren vibes. So I checked and yes, the costume designer was William Ware Thice. The two walk through the plaza. They see mutants and humans alike, and the humans act as servants called helpers. They kneel in the position of respect as the others pass. When she returns to her residence, Lyra Ah is offered her stim. The stim. My people believe it confers dignity. The one helper referred to by name is Astrid, played by Linda Grant in the third and final of her three film roles. She shows Dylan to his room. In the next scene, Lyra Ah reports to the Tyrannian Council. She. It was quite simple to win the trust of most of them, and I could soon go where I wished. But when the man from the past was discovered, I realize this to be of even greater importance than my study of their sub-shuttle system. That he's willing to serve us. If not, he's to be placed in training school. Back at her residence, Lyra Ah is bathing when helpers come in with food. Get me my robe. Dylan is starting to have second thoughts about this place. At night, when everyone is asleep, he ventures outside. Helpers are sweeping the compound. I am Isaiah. Thanks. Isaiah is played by Ted Cassidy, another friend of Gene Roddenberry. 
Theodore aka Ted Cassidy was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on July 31, 1932. He was raised in West Virginia, where he was a gifted student. In addition to his academic studies, he also played sports, with his tall stature giving him an advantage. He attended West Virginia Wesleyan College and later moved to Stetson University in Florida. With a degree in speech and drama, he married and moved to Texas where he worked at WFAA TV and radio. At 6 foot 9 inches, he was a shoo-in to play the part of Lurch the Butler on the Adams Family television show. His deep voice got him a lot of voiceover work in the industry, and that led to on-screen performances. Gene Roddenberry hired the actor to record the voiceover for Baylock in Star Trek's The Corbomite Maneuver. Ted Cassidy would return to Star Trek for several other roles, both on screen and behind the microphone. Roddenberry cast him again in his two post-apocalyptic pilots, Genesis 2 and Planet Earth. Cassidy played Bigfoot on The Six Million Dollar Man and he narrated the opening for The Incredible Hulk. Later on, he concentrated more on voiceover work. Divorced from his first wife since 1975, Ted Cassidy was engaged to be married in 1979, but Ted Cassidy died at the age of 46 on January 16, 1979 following complications from surgery. Next, Dylan Hunt is introduced to more PAX members, Dr. Kellum, played by Bill Striglos, and Singh, played by Harvey Jason, whose acting career spans four decades. Dylan questions why Pax is there infiltrating, if they're so peaceful. Those are new helpers, recently captured. This is what one Pax team is doing. Two of us have already died planning the rebellion. So the helpers are nothing more than slaves. Pax is planning a rebellion to free those slaves. They were against killing, but wouldn't they assume that people would be killed by the revolt? Act 4 begins the next day at the Turanian Council Chamber, where they ask Dylan if he'll repair their nuclear reactor. You will find it profitless to lie to us humans. Will you repair our nuclear generator? Yes or no? Now you listen to me. I came into your century ill and that's been used against me very cleverly. But I'm not sick now and I'm getting tired of being pushed around. You don't understand what this means. Tell them you'll join us gladly. And I've had the last advice I want from you, Florence Nightingale. Harry Reibold is the one who gets the pleasure of training Dylan. When Dylan refuses to take the position of respect, the mutant uses his stim device to inflict intense pain. <laughs> Dylan fights the mutant, but the other council members use their stims to subdue him. Dylan still resists. Unusual. I had to use the seventh setting. In the next moment should be even more effective. <laughs> The stem is capable of pleasure. Or do you prefer the final level of pain? When threatened with the final level of pain, Dylan reluctantly takes the position of respect. In the slave city beneath the city, Dylan tries to run from the overseer, played by Leon Askin. No talk! Your students. We remember Leon Askin from Hogan's Heroes. Take it to school five! I'm with your wife! The PAX operatives hurry Dylan off. They're almost spotted, and they're forced to hide in a training school. You will find this interesting. No physical injury. You can't die. 
I question why they would tell Dylan where their hiding place is in front of that old helper. What if he tells someone? Oh well. They proceed to the storage area. Harper Smythe is there. Miss Harper Smythe. You ought to wear a skirt more often. What in the devil are you doing here? We were sent here to tell you to forget. Collins was sent also. But he was killed in a dry thing ambush this morning. Collins. Good man. Good team leader. We were sent here to tell you to forget the revolt. But Dylan says, no way. They debate the issue until Harper Smythe shouts, Please! A revolt is not possible now. Nira Ah saw me crossing their mall this morning, and I'm sure she recognized me. In the next scene, Lyra Ah is checking Helper's faces. She's looking for Harper Smythe, who she'd spotted in the compound earlier. Leon Askin assures her, You'll have them before dark, business. Meanwhile, Dylan and the PAX operatives are making adjustments to a couple of old walkie-talkies. They'll use them to locate stims. When they're supposed to leave, Dylan says he needs more time, stating that they need the uprising to create a diversion. Hiding their stim finders behind baskets, they roam the compound in search of a stim storage site. When a mutant discovers Dylan, Lyra Ah steps in. What's that you've got there, helper? He brings me an ancient device I wish to study. Get up. Dylan pretends that his walkie-talkie is a lie detector, and he convinces Lyra Ah that she's in love with him. Don't be a fool. She makes the mistake of turning her back on him, and that's when Dylan uses a blunt object to knock her out. I know self-interest is the natural order of life. My own welfare, my... Dylan, Isaiah, and Singh locate a stash of stems. They gather them into their baskets and carry them to the underground city. There, they convince the helpers to use those stems to overpower the mutants. One group pulls a mutant off his horse and Dylan hops onto the beast. Finally, the Tyrannians are getting a taste of their own medicine when the large groups of helpers inflict pain on them. Others use the pleasure setting on themselves. <laughs> Tyrannians on horseback stand between the PAX team and the old Phoenix subway station. That only leaves the maintenance station where Lyra Ah had brought Dylan through earlier. Very bad. Tyrannians know that one. The team waits until nightfall to take a chance. They are ambushed. They fight off the attack and get inside where they find the door to the subway is locked from the inside. But it opens just in time. It's Lyra Ah. Dylan agrees to listen to her, and once again she asks him to repair the Tyrannian power station. The power station? Or oh, this time my people will destroy me too. Again, all right. They're getting here. She hands Dylan a relay that will let his friends escape. Dylan tricks the PAX team onto the sub shuttle without him, and Lyra Ah sends it on its way. Dylan is captured once again. As we know, six days ago, the man from the past unfortunately agreed to repair the Turanian nuclear generator. Another PAX team was dispatched, 
and they reported back. They discovered a missile site which, with full generator power, they will be able to use against us. PAX will need to get everyone to safety or they'll perish. Yulov runs off to the platform to investigate and he intercepts a runaway sub shuttle. I wondered if it could be you. Thanks for stopping that thing. Yulof uses this opportunity to give Dylan a real look at what they've attempted to preserve there. I set a nuclear warhead on a delayed fuse. It should have lit up the whole sky. The sentinel supposes nothing. But that's impossible. I thought you were showing me all this. Oh, you what we have to lose. They go up to the observation point, and when the sentinels report seeing no flash, Dylan is determined to go back and finish the job. You're safe, but also very frightened. Prime Minister, I've got to go back. I should try to set off the warhead at their generator, but something went wrong. Dylan wants a team, but... First, you must understand a few things about facts. <laughs> when the Primus asks if lives were taken, Dylan says, yes, a few, but there were thousands at stake. We trade one life for a thousand, couldn't we justify a hundred for more? Perhaps ten thousand for still more? That same reasoning destroyed your world, Dylan Hunt. I've just saved everything you fought over a hundred and fifty years for. You join us, Dylan Hunt. I swear to give your life or any of our lives rather than take another. A young woman and her siblings arrive from the elevator. Then there's a shock wave from that nuclear blast. It's a shock wave! <laughs> the film ends with Harper Smythe beginning a tour of Pax for Dylan. Do you like children, Dylan? No matter how many times I've seen this film, I always enjoy it. Since they were against putting chemicals into their bodies, I'm amazed that they used the tranquilizer darts. I would think it would take more than 150 years for so much to regenerate after such a nuclear holocaust. It's too bad that CBS decided not to pick it up for the regular season. I think it had potential. But Gene Roddenberry wasn't done with his idea. He'd once sold Star Trek with a second pilot, so he would pitch his idea and create another made-for-TV movie for the ABC network the following year. Remember to like, subscribe, and comment. Activate the notification bell so you'll know when to join me again as I review Gene Roddenberry's Planet Earth. Coming up on Old Joe's Reminiscence.